to another prediction video for the upcoming expansion of Ann Walker. It's been a long time coming and so we're almost there, just a little over a month left before the early release date and I for one cannot wait. But until that happy day comes, I have another predictions video to help keep us busy until then and I'm really excited for this one. Like I promised before, this is going to be a discussion all about what we know so far for one of the major trials that we're going to be up against. In each expansion that we've had so far, we've had three trials releases with the initial release date. Two trials throughout the game, and then one final trial at the end of the story, and it kind of looks like that's what's the pattern going to be from here on as well. So here's going to be discussing one of those major battles in the form of Anima. For those of you who need a little bit of history about this creature, it originates from Final Fantasy X, and I have to say that I love X. X was one of my all-time favorite games up until 14, and it was really the one that actually got me into the Final Fantasy series in the first place. The story, the characters, the summons, overall it was an amazing experience and it's still a beautiful game to this day. So if you haven't played it yet, I really recommend that you give it a chance. Now, moving on, Anima is actually a summon that we face both off in battle, but later on we can actually acquire it to fight for our team. She represents both darkness and death in the game and is a towering two-part creature whose top half is heavily restrained while the other half is some sort of horned demon in another dimension. Her symbol is anointed with the kanji for darkness and appears in the middle of her seal that blocks the player's path to her chamber of the faith until we get all the requirements we need to unlock it. We first see Anima in 10 when Seymour summons her to rid an area filled with fiends that appeared during a blitzball game. Everyone is in awe of the Aeon's power, and he later summons Anima against Yuna and her party when they confront him in Makalania. We later learn that she is actually the faith of Seymour's mother, who married a Guado man and had a half-human, half-Guado Seymour. Because of this, Seymour was rejected by pretty much everyone but his own mother. He wasn't human, but he wasn't Guado either, so he was kind of just stuck in the middle. Now, Seymour's mother thought that if she became an Aeon to protect him and have him fight against Sin, that would cause the people to want to accept him. After learning that she will soon die anyway, she decided to journey with him as his guardian all the way to Xanarkin and became an Aeon after meeting Unaleska. But the thing is, Seymour never fought with Sin. Instead, he brought her faith back to the abandoned temple of Baj and sealed her up in there. She says that because she gave him a taste of power, Seymour grew obsessed with it. And because she felt so responsible for her son's terrible actions, she offered her services to Yuna to destroy both Sin and her son's obsession with it. When she battles, she is called up from the underworld through a portal in the ground and a chain falls through to it. The chain then raises and pulls Anima up, but only her upper body, which is still bound in chains. She's able to use a mixture of attacks, all of which deal immense damage and is arguably one of the strongest Aeons in the whole game, maybe second only to the Magna Sisters. Pain, her special attack, is often an instant kill, but it also deals colossal damage to enemies immune to death spells. But nothing is more impressive or terrifying as her overdrive. She opens a gateway into the underworld where the enemy party sinks down into a crimson red dimension where her lower half, her darker demonic form, is waiting. She breaks the chains, binding her fists, and unleashes 16 devastating hits, and often it's the finishing move for most monsters. Now, the word anima is a feminine Latin and Italian name for soul or breath. Ancient Romans believed that one's anima, or their soul, resided in the chest, and when a person dies, their soul escapes the body with the breath. Anima is associated with emotion and the heart, while its metaphysical counterparts, animus, manifested in the brain and is one sense of logic. Simply put, anima can be defined as two things. One's inner self, which is in contact with the subconscious as opposed to one's outward persona or to the subconscious female physiological qualities, which reside in all males and is usually an aggregated of the man's mother, but also may incorporate aspects of sisters, aunts, and other important female characters. But what does all of this have to do with Anima in the upcoming expansion? And we even know that the original artist for Anima helped with the design, the art design team, so they adapted Anima specifically for this game. Though apparently there is a rumor that Anima is supposed to be a male, unless I mistranslated that part. 
But what I think that Anima is going to be part of is either one of two things. Either she's going to be some kind of an attempted summoning gone horribly wrong, like maybe a leftover from Alec, or a project that was created through Garlean technology and is now just being used by Xenos and Fandaniel's plants. I believe that Anima is being held in Gollumall and we will be fighting them maybe through two thirds of the game before we actually meet that point in the story. I do believe that she is the dreamer that Fandaniel spoke of though. At the end of 5.55, we have this cutscene of both Fandaniel and Xenos together, where Fandaniel admits that everything is going according to plan for the most part, since the tower was built, but all they need to do now is acquire the necessary ether. However, since they failed to get the ether from Cartano, then their only option right now is to use what he refers to as the Dreamer. At first I thought that they were referring to Xenos, since it was confirmed that he had been dreaming about the final day since he was a child. But afterwards, when Fan Daniel leaves, we hear this roar in the distance, which sounds a great deal like it came from Anima from Ten. It could be that the tower serves multiple functions, as both as maybe some kind of siphon where Aether is being absorbed into, but maybe also as a prison for Anima. If we look at the Sorrows of Warlick questline, we're introduced to Valens Van Varro, who is a corrupted, sick man who dedicated his life to creating new versions of the Ultima weapons. He uses these weapons to try and further his own goals to take over as the new Emperor, so to speak. He has resorted to all types of cruelty and just sick experiments to try to bring out like the full potential of these weapons. He doesn't care who he hurts or how many people had to suffer and die for his ambitions. And we've seen him working on these weapons using a new form of technology, what they call Oversoul, which is fusing the data core with the pilots and ultimately killing them in the end. But though Varus ultimately dies at the end of all this, the data is still out there, and it wouldn't be hard for Xenos to get his hands on it, maybe even adjust it to his own purposes. If you look at the towers, it's kind of what got me thinking about this, but what if the data that was used for the weapons is still being used but on a grander scale? What if the hostages of the beast tribes trapped inside these towers are being used in a similar way? Like being used as like batteries or something. Instead of just using one person, we're using multiple people in a kind of matrix-like network, and Anima happens to be the result of all their pain altogether. The combination of countless souls would just be what it needs to feed Anima its power, which I can't imagine that they would be able to contain for long. We do know that Xenos has his eyes fixed on Zodiac for the time being, most likely because he wishes to maybe absorb him to be able to fight against the Warrior of Lights and maybe like the ultimate showdown. But the problem is, how are they going to awaken Zodiac when he's still sundered? It could be that they're trying to maybe force a rejoining for Zodiac by maybe giving him a host of ether to kind of make up or restore whatever is still missing, especially since we still have seven other shards out there and even the Void. So it's hard to say for sure about that. But it could be that they're using the towers to be able to draw in all that necessary ether for Xenos to drink from what he calls a Sea of Souls. And ether is part of the life stream, which is literally made up of the leftover ether from souls. So maybe this infusion of power is to be able to fuse himself together with Zodiac or maybe absorb him completely. To do so, they would need to siphon off a lot of ether, though, and right now the safest place in the world to do that would probably be in Gollumon. More specifically, the Tower or the Gateway of the Gods that Van Daniel called it. In the artwork of Anima, we see that the restraints holding them and how the power just seems to be seeping out of its head. It could be that maybe they're just using what they learned of the binding of icons from Aziz Law to be able to do this, but they could be using Anima as a way to kind of store all that ether, and maybe use it to help keep them from escaping. But after seeing the damage done around the capital, it seems that maybe too much ether is being stored at once and it's starting to explode out and cause a lot of damage around its prison. Thinking back to what we learned of Zodiac and Hydaelyn, we learned that half the people of Amarat sacrificed their lives to summon him. And then later on, another half of the remaining populace sacrificed themselves so that Zodiac can breathe new life into the planet. Xenos would be aware of all of this thanks to Fan Daniel, who likely told him everything. At one point, Arnvald and Flodola are seen exploring one of these towers to try to learn more about it. 
That's when they find all of these captured Amaja trapped, like, literally inside the walls. When they tried to free those Amaja, they somehow triggered some kind of defensive failsafe and the hostages were all killed at once. It wasn't like they were instantly obliterated or anything, it was like all of their ether was just drained from them all at once. And that could be used for the sole objective of gathering ether. Because the thing is, ether is not just in the earth, it's in every living thing. And they don't have to gather it just from the earth, but they can gather it from the lives of people and beastmen. So the final days from Xenos and Fan Daniel's point of view is actually considered a good thing because they'll have access to a whole bunch of free ether being released because of all the death and destruction. And then they can gather up all of that ether together and maybe store inside of Anima. As to how we're going to get to Anima, I have another theory about that. In Roman Catholicism, we have a term known as Anima Sola, or a lonely soul. It's usually pictured as a lost soul being held in purgatory with chains binding their wrists. However, when the chains are broken, then that means that they have repented for their sins. Yet not only do they need divine assistance to be able to do this feat, they also need help of the living to be able to do so. Which I think is also strangely poetic. We could have anima bound in chains wanting to be set free, however, they're going to need both divine assistance, which could come in the form of the blessing of light, as well as mortal assistance, like from the living, which of course we have the warrior of light. I think that that's going to be perfect to be able to battle against them and set them free, and before the end of all this, I think those chains are going to break. So what I think is, they're eventually going to realize that all of these towers are siphoning off a lot of ether towards the main tower, which is in Gollumall. So we have to head to Gollumall and find a way to cut it off from the other towers. But getting to Gollumall is not going to be easy. And just as a reference, back in 10, to be able to get Anima as a summon, we first have to receive all the treasures hidden in each of the Cloister of Trials. Once we have all six from all the other temples, we return to Bosch Temple, where we gain access from the sealed underwater room. That's where we view the cutscene, that's when we learn about Anima's past and learn the truth of what made Seymour how he was. I get the feeling that Anima is going to lead to a lot of plots, a lot of answers, as well as a lot of questions, and probably maybe a big bombshell or two when we finally reach this point. I think that we'll have to travel around to find a way to actually breach the tower, but once we do get inside, that's where we meet Anima, and we learn exactly who or rather what Anima is, and have to battle with them. Perhaps by defeating Anima, then all the ether collected inside will be released, which could be bad for one of two reasons. One of which is that ether is unstable. It's only stable when it's in its crystal form. Unleashing an unimaginable load would be like unleashing a bomb on the city, which could be another reason to why the city would be so devastated as it was. But also, what if Van Daniel and Xenos are planning for the Warrior of Light to be able to get this far and for them to destroy Anima? That way they can take the Aether for whatever purpose that they have planned. Xenos could take that Aether with him, maybe flee to either the moon or to that mysterious floating islands that we've seen pictures from, and then who knows, it's very hard to say at this point. However, fulfilling the final part of his plan, whatever that may be, definitely seems to include a lot of ether and anima for some reason. Either way, I do think that with the appearance of anima, things are going to be getting pretty crazy pretty quick. Anyway everyone, thank you all so much for watching today's prediction about anima and what I think that they could be used for. A uh, problem that we have here is just we just don't know enough. We know that anima is going to be one of the trial fights, but that's basically all that we know. But I do think that they're going to be playing a big role in all this. And I do think that it's going to be and I do think that's going to be the second trial, which I think will probably be playing out maybe two thirds throughout the game. And then I don't know what we're going to be facing for the first one. I think it's going to be the Magus sisters. And the last fight, I have no clue. I could be Zodiac, could be Hydaelyn, could be anyone. So I guess we're just going to have to wait and see on that part. But I hope that you enjoyed my theory and that we're almost there for N. Walker. Like I said, it's almost a month away. As such, I decided that we're going to have five more prediction videos coming our way for each week leading up to the final week of the early release. As for next week, I will be discussing Omega and the possibility that they perform some kind of return of our favorite intergalactic death machine. 
Hope you all look forward to it, and if you have any good suggestions or ideas, please let me know, since I would love to hear about any possible future predictions, and maybe give my own personal thought to what could be coming. Anyway, once again, this is Fantasy Girl, signing out. <laughs>